Hello. It's me, Tom Rousel, historian. Welcome to Survive the Jive. This is a new type of video for this channel. Well, I used to do years ago sort of travel videos of this sort, but it's been a long time since I've just done a video where I'm walking around on holiday, basically. But uh, I'm also going to show you the beautiful ancient Greek ruins of the Agora, Agora, and the uh, the birthplace of democracy. And I'm going to climb all the way up to the temple of Hephaestus. The temple itself served once upon a time as a church of St. George. So many of these ancient buildings did get used by Christians as churches. And some of them also got turned into mosques when the Muslims took over uh, under the Ottomans. The Agora is an important place today, especially for Americans. A lot of this area was landscaped in the 1950s by an American because it's considered to be the birthplace of democracy, something that the Americans enforce worldwide at gunpoint. And it's regarded by some people as the best political system possible. The original conception of democracy is quite different to what people mean by the word now, of course, since it didn't actually give everyone an equal vote. Um, it was limited to certain privileged citizens. This was like a marketplace. It was a place for military parades. It was a place where lots of people gathered and chatted, discussed philosophy and other things. And it was in that climate that the idea in the fifth century BC of democracy took hold among some Athenian intellectuals. The city of Athens, the capital of Greece, is of course named after the goddess Athena, Pallas Athena, who is uh, uh, the same as the Roman goddess Minerva. She's quite a warlike figure with a helmet on. Sometimes people like to typify the Athenians as the weak effect equivalent of the Spartans who were more strong, but I think it's a little bit of a simplification because all Greeks had a sort of militant culture to some extent as well. And uh, you can't use that dichotomy to entirely understand the distinction. Oh, and there's a church, old early church of some sort. I arrived in Greece last night. I was tired. I'd been up since 4 a.m. And in fact, I had been up 4 a.m. the day before as well, because I had to go to Ireland before I could come to Greece. This is the Agora, yeah. Enter. Uh, I don't think... Enter, enter. I can't get in here because there's a lock. But yeah, I entered down there. This. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I guess I went the wrong way. I can't get up to Hephaestus Temple this way. I don't know if he was trying to help me or was asking me to help him. Well, I'll try and find my way up that hill. Well, I definitely went the wrong way before. I don't have to leave the Agora to get to the Temple of Hephaestus. I think that's the Temple of Hephaestus. Hephaestus is the same as the Roman god Vulcan. Hephaestus might be the son of Zeus and Hera. Bing bong. We bongs love the sound of a bong. Oh, here's an interesting and ahistorical depiction of Socrates, my man Socrates. He knows all about philosophizing. He's talking to a Chinaman, a Chilean. Uh, Socrates and Confucius and encounter an encounter that never occurred. What would they discuss? Fortune cookies? An interesting statue. I wonder if the Chinese government paid for it. It's from 2021. Lots of people here still wearing masks, so they are very respectful of Chinese culture in Greece. Um, well, I tread with these sandaled feet upon the same hallowed ground by the philosophers of 
ancient Athens discussed funny things that have reverberated through the centuries, through the millennia, creating the world we now inhabit. What a sacred place. Not really. The sacred place is up there. Although they did, I believe, use the Agora for some kind of uh, festivals for Athena at times. Um, but yes, Hephaestus, he was the god of blacksmithing and sculpture. I suppose in our own religion, he would be roughly equivalent to Vuland, Wayland, but not, of course, entirely equivalent since Wayland is mm, not strictly speaking a god, or he's sort of a god, but he's um, not the same. Whereas, you know, Vuland doesn't have this direct connection to the king of the gods, like, like Vulcan Hephaestus does. So yeah, of course, there's not quite the exact same equivalency, but yeah, I think there's a similarity. Hephaestus was obviously highly revered by the Athenians to have such a prominent temple in this place. Um, being a god of sculpture, you can imagine him being very important to the Greeks, since they were the most accomplished race in the world uh, in the, the classical period when it came to sculpture. But uh, maybe even you could argue that they remain so even now. Um, I quite, I quite enjoy this weather. It's nice and hot. I was in Ireland yesterday in Dublin, being rained on. Uh, it wasn't so pleasant, and it's so expensive in Ireland. Whereas here, it's much more affordable. The, uh, the, they both have in common an abundance of American tourists. It's funny because much, many parts of England, Britain is one of the most visited parts of Europe. It's extremely popular tourist destination, but you don't actually necessarily find an abundance of Americans among them. Americans are more interested in coming to Athens and Dublin. Oh, look at these little chaps. Hello. Hello, cat. This is Greece, not Egypt, so they don't have any sacred status here. I haven't brought an offering for Hephaestus. Somewhere among the ruins down there, my wife and children are looking around, but I've decided to abandon them so that I can scale this hill at a more appropriate pace for enjoyable viewing. You wouldn't like it if I had my children with me because it would be very, very slow. Uh, thank you. <laughs> ah. Doric style, I believe. Yes, the Temple of Hephaestus, 460 to 415 BC. That's 5th century BC. Interesting to know that almost everything of note in the ancient Greek history, not everything, but you know, the majority of things and people that you associate with ancient Greece all happened in that century, the 5th century BC. Socrates, Plato, the first historian, Herodotus, many of these temples, Athenian democracy, the Parthenon, all of it, first century BC. And it's, when you think of Greek history, you can sometimes think of it being a much wider period. Of course, the Greeks had influence for a much longer period, even under Roman rule. The Romans are arguably a cargo cult of Greek copycats. But um, they, they have um, really concentrated their greatness in that one century. Uh, that's when the most impressive achievements of their race occurred. I can see some of the carvings up there still. I'm not sure if you can see. Most of them are missing. Interesting that the, you can see that above the columns and in between them, you see these three bars. That is a surviving, an architectural nod to the earlier architectural traditions of the Greeks before everything was built in stone. They had temples built in wood. Don't think any survive or very many survive. That sort of 
architectural style, but they weren't always stone builders. But they had these wooden, uh, I don't know, struts going along above the columns. The first columns would have been wood as well. And when they shifted to using marble and stones of other kinds, they kept the tradition of, using, of, of having those exposed ends of the wooden beams, which is why they're there. Uh, some people use the arbitrary metric of surviving stone monuments to determine how uh, impressive or successful or advanced a culture was. Of course, that's a ridiculous and arbitrary metric, but um, even the Greeks themselves, famous for their stone sculpture, began with wood. Wood's an excellent material, especially in Northern Europe. But around here, I suppose, stone is more logical because it makes for much cooler buildings. My home in Devon is built partly with stone, but partly with mud. Um, so the idea that we Northerners live in mud huts is still true to some extent. But I tell you, uh, although in the summer, I'm glad that part of it's made of stone, because that keeps it cool. In the winter, I'm glad that part of it's made of mud because it's a much better insulator than stone and stone buildings are very difficult to keep warm in cold weather. Uh, but I don't think well, that's really a concern for Greek people because it's a hot country. So it's remarkable how well it survived. Look at that. The frieze depicts the labors of Hercules. <laughs> That building up there, that's the Parthenon, on top of the Acropolis. I should have known that. And I was heading towards it thinking it was the Temple of Hephaestus. Too tired. But hey, look, you see this? Little chaps playing music, dancing, riding on goats. Many people will call these cherubs. I believe a cherub comes from a Hebrew word, a cherubim. In ancient pagan times here in Europe, these little chaps were called putti. Uh, and uh, some, for some reason, the Hebrew term under Christendom became attached to the little chaps uh, and they're called cherubs. I don't know how the Jews actually traditionally depicted cherubim, but it's not like that. It's kind of similar to how angels became associated, like the way that angels are popularly depicted in Christian art is basically the same as classical figures like Victory, Nike, whatever. Um, they are just beautiful humans with wings, but that's not at all how Jews depicted them. So the power of pagan iconography was so great that it survived easily after Christianization. Maybe also because the uh, conventional depictions of these Hebraic entities was uh, not particularly attractive to European people, so they prefer to use more pagan looking things like the putti or, or the gods or whatever. The entrance to the gymnasium built over the Odeon has these three very impressive Triton statues. I would not fall off the edge. There's four foot. <laughs> Here she is, Nike, or Nike, aka Victory. And it's her who we use as the template for the so called angelos or angels uh, in Christian art. So I'm at the museum now. Nice to be out of the sun, even though I do enjoy the heat. Um, I'm not one of those people who always complains about heat. I don't use air conditioning. I like the heat, but it's not a good idea to stay too long in the sun, even though I'm an Englishman and we're famous for doing that. Hey, here he is, the first ever historian, Herodotus. What else shall I see? Bing bong again, always the bing bong. It must be 12 bong. Check this out. Chariot. 
the monument base for the victory of Crates in the Apovatis race at the Panathenaic Games. Very Indo-European chariot racing. Interesting that the chariot here is depicted also with just four spokes. Same thing in Bronze Age stuff from Mycenae, uh, and also Bronze Age chariot depicted at um, Shivik in Sweden from roughly the same time, contemporary with Mycenae. But as far as I'm aware, the chariots never had just four spokes. They always had more spokes. Not a very stable wheel. So it makes me wonder whether there was a religious convention of depicting a chariot wheel with just four spokes so that it resembles the solar cross. The chariot is associated with the sun in numerous Indo-European religions, as I've mentioned in many videos. Here is a votive relief dedicated to, dedicated by Neoptolemus, Neo uh, depicting Hermes handing over the infant Dionysus to the nymphs in the cave of Pan. So that must be baby, baby Dionysus. You know what it reminds me of? The nativity scene. You've got the baby, you've got God above, that's Zeus. The faces have all been chipped off by adherence to a certain Semitic cult. But you can still work out who's, who's who. Obviously this is Pan with his little goat legs. Aphrodite or Aphrodite with no head. What a shame so many heads are missing. Is this where I enter? Yes, entrance. <coughs> Pots. Pots, not people. Some of you anti-axial age types might not be so happy that I've shown everything from the 5th century BC. So here's something from the 8th century BC long before that and uh, it's quite based as you can see swastikas all over it and three horses also flanked by four swastikas very interesting they call it geometric burial offering those naughty geometric shapes that will get you arrested in certain countries Here's the same motif again. Three horses. This is from a woman's grave of the late geometric period. Also 8th century BC. Seems that swastikas on a lot of them. But not always. So this one has a Greek meander, and the one behind it has swastikas and meanders. I don't know what the swastika means in classical and Bronze Age Greece, but I don't necessarily think it has a meaning. It might just be like the Greek meander, a geometric shape used for decorative purposes. I don't think it's always correct to assign a special esoteric meaning to a shape used in decorative ways. Um, although in the Germanic context, it clearly does have some clear esoteric meaning because of the way it's used, not in a purely decorative sense, but it obviously has some kind of magical associations. But I don't think that's clear in, in ancient Greek. 5th century BC. Archaic sculptures. The, the archaic sculptures have very different features to those of the classical period. Generally they're considered inferior, but there's also something strikingly powerful about them. I'm guessing that the lion head on top means that this is Hercules, but very different from later depictions of him. Here's the classical period for comparison. Very different. It's thought to be Nike as well. Nike in bronze. I love the bronze. <laughs> There's a lot of people here. 
These are three depictions of the god Eremus. And they were originally on plinths uh, above genitalia, which do not survive. And uh, one of them has been mutilated in the typical style with the nose taken off, but it was put back on again. That's because it wasn't done in the Christian period. But much, much earlier, before Christians, there were other people who ended up mutilating statues, but then the pagans repaired them afterwards. Apollo. Looking quite striking here. This is likely a copy, it says, of uh, Apollo Lukios in his attribute as a god of light, a larger statue stood in Aristotle's famous school of philosophy. It may have looked the same. Certain people on the internet like to make a cult of Apollo, which is quite distinct from the ancient cult, and they regard Apollo in a way that would have been quite surprising to any of the people of the time uh, when he was actually worshipped. Because their reason for focusing on Apollo above all other gods is they, they consider him to be more Aryan, and by that they mean Indo-European rather than Indo-Iranian, which is what the word really means. But uh, they think that, I don't know why, because he was a god probably imported to uh, Greek worship from Anatolia. Um, not, doesn't mean necessarily mean he wasn't an European in origin, but uh, certainly he's possibly not from Europe. And of course, he's also gay. He is a god who is well attested in mythology as, as doing gay things. So, yeah, they, uh, these, I, if you want to worship Apollo, that's fine, but I just think um, worship Apollo, the god, as he is actually known, and not this fake Apollo that they just made up. Uh, these kind of people, if you don't know who I'm talking about, then don't worry about it. They're not important anyway, but there's just some funny people on the internet who have invented a cult of Apollo because they consider that, uh, and none of these people are Greek anyway, they're all Americans, uh, likely of British descent and Germanic descent, who say that Odin is invented by the Jews and Norse mythology is Jewish, that uh, the real god of the Northern Europeans is Apollo. And they don't really have any evidence to support that absurd claim, but uh, they're not the sort of people who really care about evidence. I think it's interesting also to compare the classical period and you know, 5th century BC style Greek sculpture at its height to later sculpture under the Roman um, period. Um, these ones are from the 1st century BC to the 1st century AD. You see that there's much more realistic features, that one not so much in the middle, but they're, they're notably individual humans with wrinkles on their faces and stuff. And even this satyr from the same period is comparatively ugly compared to like the classical, the earlier classical sculpture. So here again, these are a period of Trajan, Emperor Trajan. They're just looking like real Mediterranean men's faces. Whereas the people in the classical, the, the fifth century BC, the sculptures where the gods or men have a sort of inhuman quality. This, the proportions of the features don't really resemble any race that exists now, or probably even any that existed then, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they really did have a unique phenotype that died out by the time of Roman occupation. But uh, yeah, I mean, the archaic style, the early classical style and the Roman style, three very distinct periods in sculpture. Which of them was most beloved by the god of sculpture, Hephaestus. I'm gonna guess it was that time during the fifth century BC when Greece was at her height. And still those types of statue have a sort of power that is not really seen anywhere else. And you know it and you see it. It's the sort of, it's flat, no, it's flat foreheads which are parallel to the nose, uh, which almost in an extension of the nose, like the forehead and the nose are almost one thing. 
and uh, these small but protruding chins and very thin little lips. It's a, it's a very powerful, almost um, supernatural appearance. And you can understand why it was used to depict the gods. Um, I suppose the actual sculpt, like talent of the sculptures under the Roman period may have been greater because then they're using actually realistic depictions of, of people. But um, it depends whether you value sculpture only based on its ability to reflect uh, physical realities or whether it's more to do with its ability to reflect metaphysical realities. I wonder which Hephaestus considered more important. And there's his temple over there. A statue of Demeter, the Earth Mother. Third century BC. Helios looks a bit like Alexander. Well, I think that's enough for this video. In the next video, I'll go to the Parthenon, climb up the Acropolis over there. And um, somewhere up there. And you'll um, also find there'll be another video of me going to Sunil, is that how it's pronounced, where the Temple of Poseidon at the sea is, and I'll also do a collaborative video with Ancient, Greek, Ancient Greece to be re revisited uh, at that site. And then after that, a couple of weeks later, I'm going to be headed to Turkey, to Istanbul, where I'll try and find the runes in the Hagia Sophia church, uh, if I can, because there are some Viking runes inside that church. Um, so watch this space. If you like it, don't forget, like, subscribe, all the rest of it. Consider becoming a patron. And you can get access to all kinds of extra content and to chat with me on a wonderful uh, voice chat on Telegram. And for now, let's take a look at Poseidon's realm.